Hello everybody and welcome to another video. I wanted to talk to you today about the next big PvE update because there's going to be a very interesting mechanic going on there and a really good opportunity for me to teach you guys about some of the most interesting lore really, some of the best lore that exists in Guild Wars 2 and it's actually going to be quite relevant for the next update that comes up. So basically if you guys don't know it's going to be called Cutthroat Politics and it's not going to be about Glint which is what I kind of thought it might have been about. It's not going to be about Glint, it's going to be about an election for the Lion's Arch Council. Council. If you guys remember last chapter of the living story, one of the characters that was on the council died and the new book actually has got a lot about the council members of Lion's Arch if you're interested in that. But one of the council members died and now they're looking to replace that character. Um, and we the players get to vote for who ends up on the council. It's going to be either Ellen Keel, who is a character we've known about quite a bit and have spent a fair bit of time with in the living story, or Evan Nashblade, who's not so much been in the living story a lot until quite recently, but he's the guy in charge of the Black Lion. And they're both going to be running for a seat and we get to choose who goes on it. Uh, basically as the update goes out we're going to get an item that will be dropping around the world uh, and we can collect that item, you can collect loads of them if you want and use them to vote multiple times for the person that we want. It's not like a perfectly democratic system, it's a pirate election so it's not necessarily the character with the most people supporting it, it's the character with the people who worked hardest to put them in place. That's kind of how it's going to work. Um, and the choice we make here for which character goes on the council uh, is actually going to impact supposedly the storyline in the future of the game. Um, they did a live stream actually where they mentioned even years in the future, like real time, you know, two years down the line for Guild Wars 2, that character could still be on the council and could still be making decisions about the living story and where it goes. Uh, which is a cool idea. I, I think it'd be quite nice to be playing the game in 2015 and seeing that, say, Ellen Keel is still making decisions for us. But again, you know, we're never really going to know the difference that that character is actually going to make instead of another. You know, it could mean just an odd dialogue change here or there and, and nothing more. And otherwise, they've got the story generally worked out and we're not actually changing anything. And in particular, with the way the living story works, because only one character can ever be chosen and we will never see the other option. That's a cool idea and I like it, but it also does mean we can never go and see what might have happened. You know, with most games where you get choices, you can like do a replay and see what might have happened. We kind of get none of that with this. So the fact that the character might change the story in the future to me is sort of arbitrary because the devs are just going to move it in whatever direction they want to but you know it's a cool idea at least so I can I, I can get behind them for that I would say in future if they're going to do this they should sort of set up what's going to be affected first so like okay here's a problem Palawa Joko's come and killed the leaders of the the Order of Whispers or something and now we have these two candidates and one of them wants to help the Order of Whispers in this way and one of them wants to help the Order of Whispers in this way or the other person doesn't want to help them at all now you the players get to vote I think that makes more sense because right now we're just kind of voting blindly for that but you know that aside that the fact that fact about the story aside that it is sort of a blind vote because we don't know what how it's going to change the story uh, there are a few tangible things that will change depending on who we go with okay regardless of the story there's like mechanical stuff to do with the game that will change um first of all if you vote for Ellen Keel to be on the council, um, for the next four weeks after that happens, in-game in Guild Wars 2, all waypoint costs are going to be reduced. Okay, that's pretty massive. Uh, or if you vote for Evan Nashblade to be on the council, for the next four weeks, Black Lion Keys are going to have a reduced price. Which actually isn't so good. Uh, we don't know how much either is going to be reduced. It could be like 90% off of Black Lion Keys, but only 2% off of Waypoint costs, for example. We don't know that the values, or I don't think we know the values. Uh, but even, I would say, even just a tiny drop, if we don't go stupidly extreme like I just did, even a tiny drop on Waypoints is really significant. Because basically, Waypoints, everyone in the game is going to be using all the time, right? Not everybody likes Black Lion Keys. Not everybody wants to invest in all the stuff that Black Lion Chess might be able to give you, or want to sift through all of that crap or a lot of people might just be against gems in general and just not care about that element of the game. It's really hard to play Guild Wars 2 and not care about waypoints. So just on that alone I feel like Ellen Keel is like way out in the lead. You know most players that only care about earning their money and just going through the game in a standard way and don't care about the story at all. I think Ellen Keel's won it already basically on that unless the black line keys are ridiculously cheap. Uh, and another thing as well that you've got to consider as well for um, Evan Nashblade is if you're really voting 
voting for the Black Line Keys, you're basically voting for RNG. A, a vote for Nash Blade is a vote for RNG. And I think RNG is something the community at large also doesn't favour too much. So, you know, I would put myself, just based on this information, in Ellen Keel's camp right now. I'd be saying to everybody, okay, get your tokens when you get in game, and I'm going to tell you to go and vote for Ellen Keel. But, however... The waters get kind of muddy with this next thing, which is what I want to spend the bulk of the video on. Um, in addition to adding the Aetherblade Retreat and the Molten Facility, which were two Living World dungeons which we've now seen removed from the game, ArenaNet, in addition to adding those two, ArenaNet will also add one completely unique fractal that is based on the character we vote for. Okay, so we're going to get three fractals added. Two of them, Aetherblade Retreat and Molten Facility, will be guaranteed. But the last one is determined by our character. We will only see one of those fractals. And it's not even built yet. They're building it from scratch after the results come in at the end of this next chapter of the living story. And the fractal that isn't picked is basically going to be left on a shelf forevermore. As far as we know, they're not going to have any plans to ever add it. They might eventually, but they've not made it, made it sound that way at all. We're going to get one fractal added and we choose which one it is. Uh, and I've got a couple of friends that, you know, don't like that idea at all. That say, look, if they've got good concepts for at least two different fractals, they should just go ahead and make both of them. Don't make your community choose between the content you're going to put out. And I kind of understand that to an extent. But I also feel like on some level, there's always decisions that the devs are having to make like this, where they only have the time or resources to make one thing or another. And I think adding that little bit of extra transparency and putting that decision in the player's hands, but in a more fun way, is actually quite a, a remarkable thing to do that you don't really see gaming companies do that often so as long as it's arena net backed into a corner and they can only do one or the other then i'm happy with it if it's the other situation where they could do both but they're withholding one to do some gimmicky thing for the living story then i'm against it and i'm, I'm gonna go with i favor it for now i think it's good and i do think that you know they've only got a certain amount of living story teams anyway that's by the by okay what are the fractals that we get to pick right Ellen Keel, who I've just been explaining to you, uh, basically would be winning it alone. Ellen Keel, if we vote for her, we have a fractal developed that is based on the Thormanova reactor. This is a large facility you can see up in the northwest of Metrica province. It's where the fire elemental meta event happens. There is some lore about it. It is an interesting place, but there isn't that much lore to do with it. It's basically the inquest failed an experiment there and things are just messed up right now. And they're messed up in a really weird way, but we don't know why. Like There's weird energies going on there. It's created these steam creatures. These are uh, very interesting characters that haven't been explained in lore at all yet, except they're associated somehow with this design at this reactor and then the inquest moved on and now they're trying to build something else like the Thormanova reactor. I believe that the, the Crucible of Eternity is actually where that's happening. There's also an area in Ascalon that seems to be connected the Chaos Crystal Cavern jumping puzzle that somehow connected the Thormanova reactor and it's a bit of a mysterious place and if we want if we vote for Ellen Keel there will be a fractal that explains the disaster that happened there and probably shed some light for us. Okay and I might do a full video on that story some other time but if we vote for Evan Nashblade, instead we'll get a fractal based on the fall of Abaddon. Okay, arguably, this one is far, far, far better than the Thorman Overreactor idea. Uh, Evan Nashblade's on the fall of Ascalon. Okay, that's what the bulk of this video is going to be on. Uh, I want to give you guys this story about Abaddon. This is heavy Guild Wars 1 lore, so it's pretty easy for me at this point, but a lot of people might have missed out on it. A lot of people might not understand why this is a particularly exciting concept. And I also want to talk to you guys about why, in a small way, I might not actually want to vote for this at all, and we, I, I might want to vote for Thorman Overreactor. So yeah, if you guys are wondering what the fall of Abaddon is all about and which fractal sounds more fun to you. You've just had your description of Thorman over. Now, uh, here's, here's about Abaddon, basically. Abaddon, okay, is a character in the universe. He was one of the six human gods uh, in ancient times. A long time ago, when the gods still lived on Tyria and they lived in the city of Or, Abaddon was one of them. Uh, all the gods are named after a certain thing that they command or that they are known for. Um, Abaddon was the god of water, or oceans, and secrets, okay? 
okay? Water and Secrets, that's what he was known as. Uh, and just before I go into more information about Abaddon, a little bit more backstory as well, okay? Um, about the Elder Dragons. Elder Dragons eat magic, okay? This is a big thing, it's a big part of the Guild Wars 2 storyline. If you didn't understand it already, Elder Dragons eat magic. Back during the previous Elder Dragon Rising, before the human gods even came to Tyria and the Elder Dragons reawoke as we see now, uh, all the way back to during the old Elder Dragons Rising, there was a race called the Seers, okay? And these guys gathered up all of the unspoiled magic in the world um, in an attempt, basically, to hide it and keep it from the Elder Dragons. The Elder Dragons just eat magic, they eat, eat, eat until it's all gone. So the Seers gathered it all up and, and tried to lock it away from the Elder Dragons. And what they did was they gathered all of this pure magic up and they locked it within a massive stone called the Bloodstone, okay? And this is like, a, not a stone that you could hold in your hand, this is like a massive, huge, flat disc platform, like a concrete platform, you know, like hundreds of meters wide that you could walk around on, right? This huge thing called the Bloodstone, and it contained all of this raw, pure, powerful magic, right? And I guess the, the insinuation there as well, this is my own theory, but the insinuation there is that Tyria somehow survived the previous Elder Dragon Rising, because the Seers, in part, had managed to lock away a lot of the magic that kept the life force or energies or whatever going on Tyria, so eventually the dragons had to go back to sleep, and there was enough there to sustain at least the five races that were previously fighting the Elder Dragons, or something like that. But anyway, that was the Seer's plan, okay? And they created this bloodstone. Uh, and even later, years later, um, when the, the Seers had been destroyed by their enemies, the Massart, and the Elder Dragons had gone back to sleep, the bloodstone still existed. Um, and in the year 1 BE, okay, which is a year before the year zero, okay, so about a thousand years ago, a thousand three hundred years ago from current day in Guild Wars 2, um, back in the year 1 BE, the, the human gods had come to Tyria, and they had found the bloodstone. So Ab and the other gods had found this bloodstone um, and when they found it they used it like I don't know whether it was particularly Abaddon's idea at the time Guild Wars 1 made it sound like it was sort of a joint decision and Guild Wars 2 makes it sound like it was more Abaddon um, but these gods and Abaddon decided they would use this bloodstone that they'd found uh, to give magic back to the races of the world but this was pure uncontained magic and, and they just gave it to all of these races it just caused chaos and war and strife and, and suffering all around the world as people just war and good and manipulated it and it was just too much power for what were essentially primitive races on Tyria. Now at this time there were kingdoms of men and there was a, a really important character in the lore named King Doric. King Doric was the first true king of men when he was around Kryta, Ascalon and Or. All these places were just one large nation of men, okay? And Doric saw all of this damage that was being done by the, this magic and decided no, we've got to do something about this. So he makes a trek to Ara, he goes to Or and he pleads with the gods, please take the magic back. Now in Guild Wars 2 while you're playing around in Or, you will see all these references to this guy, King Doric, to his trek, particularly in Ara. There's a waypoint called the Doric's Waypoint, and this is the guy that they're talking about. Uh, and the gods saw this, and they saw him plea, and there's a story about how Duena, the leader of the gods, was moved by his plea, uh, and they accepted. They decided, okay, that, that's, that's fair enough. We will take this magic back. What they did was they split the bloodstone with all this magic power. They split it into five distinct pieces. Uh, one of those pieces was called the keystone. And that keystone supposedly will be used one day to bring the bloodstone back into one whole piece. But that story has never happened and it's never been resolved. But regardless, they split the bloodstone into five distinct pieces. And in doing this, they had to use King Doric's blood. Uh, and that's actually how the bloodstones got their name. The Seers made it a long time ago, but uh, I guess it didn't really have its name until this moment where King Doric uh, used his blood with the gods to split it again. And then it became known as the Bloodstone. It was in five pieces. Uh, and they threw all five of these shards into the largest volcano on all of Tyria. That later erupted, which sent the shards all over the continent. In Guild Wars 1, we actually got to know the locations of three of those Bloodstones, and we got to go to all of them. In Guild Wars 2, presumably they're still there, but we can't go to a single one. If you actually play a human character, or if you've ever spent any time in Divinity's Reach, if you go to Queen Jenna's throne room, you can see behind her, there looks like something that could perhaps be one of these shards of the bloodstone, but it's not confirmed and it's kind of weird. I like to think it might be, but I'm not sure what significance that would have on the story. Um, but yeah, the, the shards of the bloodstone were spread out, and as far as we know, you can't access any in Guild Wars 2, except for maybe that one in the throne room. Uh, now, the name of the volcano where the gods threw the bloodstone originally was called Abaddon's Mouth. Now, why is that? And the answer is probably because Abaddon himself 
wasn't pleased with the god's decision to take all of the magic back. In fact, he felt so strongly about it that he went to war with the other five gods. He wanted everyone to keep having magic. He thought it was a great idea and he wanted magic to be out there. So when the gods took it back, they did it without his consent and he got pissed. Now, why did he feel so strongly about magic being out there? Uh, they've never actually given us an answer. You can play the card that basically he was just evil and he, he wanted to see chaos interior and he was just a bad guy. And that's, that's a pretty fair answer. It's a boring one, but it's a fair answer. Or uh, you can go into a lot more interesting theories about maybe how Abaddon already knew about the Elder Dragons. He was the god of secrets, after all. Uh, you know, you can go with those theories. I might do a specific video on those at some point. But basically, Abaddon was not happy that magic was taken away again. And he went to war over it. And the other gods decided, right, we've got to get rid of this guy. We we've got to fight him. Uh, and the result of this war, this war between gods that happened on Tyria, was that Abaddon was defeated and he was banished to a, a realm of imprisonment in a place called the Realm of Torment. Uh, and after that happened, the, the gods were like, wow, we've wrought all this destruction on the world, we've done all this terrible stuff, we're going to leave. And that was known as the Exodus of the Gods, and that's where human... This was such a significant year, such a powerful moment in the history of, of Guild Wars, that this was the year that humans started counting time from. We say it's the year 1325, or 1326, and that's because of this year. Year zero was now, and these are the events that caused that to happen. Okay? So this is big stuff, right? Uh, now, Abaddon, after that, he stayed there in the Realm of Torment for a thousand years, all the way until the events of Guild Wars 1. Uh, and during the events of Guild Wars 1, a human named Cormir uh, was approached by the other gods, basically, and they gave her the gift to take Abaddon's power and absorb it into herself. And in doing that, she took all of Abaddon's essence and became a god herself. And she became the god of water and truth, where Abaddon was the god of water and secrets, she was the god of water and truth. And she very quickly gave water up to Lyssa. Um, but basically the, the, the result here was then we once again had the six true gods reunited. Right. I hope you guys kept up with me. That's that's pretty much the bulk of the stuff, okay? Uh, because this fractal basically is just going to be about that incredibly significant moment that marks the, the beginning of time, the beginning of calendars, uh, when Abaddon was overthrown, when Abaddon was defeated and imprisoned within the realm of torment. That's this fractal. Uh, it's pretty cool, right? I, I think, you know, there's enough reason there immediately to be quite excited about it. But I want to talk to you guys about specific things we could see in the fractal. Because that's the overall story. I feel like a lot of people know already. What did we find out specifically in the first game that can help us determine what ArenaNet might do? Uh, and there's actually quite a lot. Because Nightfall was one of the campaigns in Guild Wars 1. And that entire campaign was basically about this god. It was about Abaddon. And it was about, as I say, Cormir usurping him and uh, and fighting him within the realm of torment so that we we know a lot about who he was and, and how he died uh, for example in Guild Wars 1 you can visit the very the, the, the precise spot where Abaddon died and Abaddon was overthrown okay so we're gonna have a fractal that returns us to an exact location we already know about from Guild Wars 1 it was a place called the Ruins of Mora. See, Abaddon was the god of waters, as I say, and, and as the god of water, he actually sort of had a whole domain that was basically an ocean. Uh, he ha his domain was the Crystal Sea. Now, the Crystal Sea doesn't exist anymore, and that's because it was Abaddon's domain, and when he died and he was imprisoned, all of the waters of the Crystal Seas in that region, uh, they, they dried up. The whole area just suddenly became devoid of water, uh, and instead, it became desert. It became the Crystal Desert, which is what you can see on your map now in Guild Wars 2, and you've probably been hearing a lot about with recent updates. Hell, this new update is going to add a new back piece for us, by the way, called a Desert Flower. So there's even more hints that we might be able to go here. But that was originally an ocean. It was the Crystal Sea, and when Abaddon died, it all dried up. Now, the, the exact spot where he died could have been just out in open waters, because he was the god of water and he didn't need land, for example. He could have been sm smoked down by the other gods just directly over water, and then it all dried up and it became dry land. But we do know the exact spot, because after he died and after all of the waters dried away, humans found that there was like a lingering haunting uh, and like a connection between Tyria and Abaddon's prison, uh, the Realm of Torment, at this exact location where he was banished. 
vanished. There was like a remnants of a portal or some close overlap between these two dimensions, these two realms, between Tyria and the realm of Torment. Uh, so humans saw this, uh, and then the gods left, they went on their exodus, so humans were just sort of left with this horrible portal looking thing on their land. So what they did was back then, humanity were quite strong, you know, they were all united under King Doric and so forth, uh, and they saw this and they had quite a noble goal. Basically, they built a city there, the city of Mora, okay? It was a city on the front lines, okay? It was a forever haunted city and a dangerous city and an eerie city and probably not the nicest place to live, but the people that were there were, were soldiers and there were people out there watching this portal, essentially keeping Abaddon at bay, uh, watching ever onwards as, as the desert slowly spreads around them and Abaddon gains strength from inside his own prison. Uh, there was this really awesome thing that the men of Mora built called uh, the Solitary Colossus that you could see in Guild Wars 1 was this like massive structure, this massive pillar that they built there that you eventually break down. And I always thought that was quite a cool name and a quite quite a cool area. But anyway, Mora itself as a city lasted for maybe 200 years or so, um, but then the, the spread of the desert became too, too much for them. Uh, the corruption from this portal thing became too much and the whole area just became a sulfurous wasteland and mankind were pushed out and they had other troubles going on as well. These were not just Tyrians, but Presumably Alonans as well, you know, this is this is right on the borders of Alona we're talking about where Abaddon was smote down. Um, so uh, essentially this area where Abaddon was smote down would eventually become the desolation and men defended it for a while but were eventually forced to leave. Uh, one thing I would like to read you guys is the description of the city of Mora that you could go to in Guild Wars 1 because uh, I always thought it had a really nice poetic description that I always found quite cool. Uh, it described Mora as this, um, the grandeur of this ancient Elonian city can still be seen amid its crumbling visage, echoes of a noble and grand purpose. Originally established to watch over the mouth of Torment, which is the name of the portal left behind by Abaddon, Mora was ever a haunted place. It was abandoned to 200 years after its founding, succumbing to the spread of the desert. Recent ruptures from the crater have further destroyed this once majestic city as the realm of torment seeps in through the cracks of reality. So that's what Mora looked like in Guild Wars 1's time. It might not even be there in Guild Wars 2's time, um, but that's kind of what it looked like. Anyway, back to, back to the fractal, basically. What I'm trying to say is this means, in theory, uh, that the fractal can be set in entirely open oceans and open waters, and that's where the fractal is. Or it could be set on an island in the middle of an ocean and Abaddon is sort of stationed on that island. And eventually all the waters will dry up around it and then the city of Mora would be built where that island is. Uh, if the production values are there, basically, Arena Net could do some really cool stuff. This fractal is about the fall of Abaddon. So when he dies, if they have the budget or the time or the inclination to do it, they can create a bloody cool fractal that is surrounded by water on all sides. And, and halfway through the fractal or at the end of the fractal, uh, all the water dries up and it opens up all these new avenues for, for ways we could play or it would just look very cinematic and cool. Uh, I think that would be really, really interesting and that's one of the most exciting things I'm looking forward to if we manage to get this fractal going. That could be really cool to see. So, so what else can we see potentially in this fractal, like specifics? Another thing about the, the gods in Guild Wars lore is for every god, there are these inscriptions. Inscriptions that humans have written about them, stories about the gods back when they used to live on the planet in awe, right? Uh, every single god has had one of them, and even Abaddon 2 has one. Now, it, it was hard to find an inscription about Abaddon because after the gods cast him from the world and banished him to a prison, they tried to remove all existence of him ever being there and that meant they got rid of a lot of these inscriptions. However, at the climax, basically, of the Guild Wars 1 story, if you want, you can take the time to find one of these inscriptions, there's only one in the entire game, and you can read a really cool story, okay? I'm going to read you guys this story because uh, it's going to tie quite heavily into this fractal as what we can see. Okay, so this is an inscription about Abaddon and it describes the moment when Abaddon very first gave magic to some people of Tyria. Okay, the very first moment he gave magic. So we're talking about just after they found the bloodstone potentially. Okay, this is what the, how the story goes. And so it came to pass that Jadoth, being persecuted by the horrific forgotten armies and hounded from his home did seek refuge among the cooling mists of the Crystal Sea. Untold weeks passed as Jadoth huddled in his sanctuary, with nothing to see save the endless ripples of the boundless ocean. 
On the 51st day of his exodus, a frightful sight manifested before Jadith's eyes, the unmistakable shape of forgotten warships upon the horizon's shimmering edge. And prayed Jadoth, Abaddon, Lord of the everlasting depths, keeper of secrets, open mine eyes and bestow upon me the knowledge of the abyss, that I might smite mine enemies and send them to the watery depths. An unsettling silence swept across the waves, the twilight sky shattered, and stars streaked down upon the forgotten armada. The seas boiled and ruptured, and gave birth to a maelstrom, from which not even light could escape, and transforming the sky above into a midnight void. And thus was magic gifted to Jadoth, chosen of Abaddon, the first of the Marganites. Okay, so that's the story. It's a pretty cool story. The Marganites basically uh, were a, a group of seafaring humans who lived on the Crystal Sea. Now, most Guild Wars 1 veterans will think of magical purple demon things when they hear the word Marganite. Uh, but that's just what Marganites looked like after they had been cast down with Abaddon. See, Abaddon had these people, these Marganites stood at Abaddon's side. They were his people. And when a Abaddon himself was cast down to the Realm of Torment, so too were they. And when you meet them in Guild Wars 1, they're your enemies, because Abaddon is your enemy, and they're all corrupted and they look like demons. Uh, but in truth, the, the, the Marganites were humans just like any other, just like humans you see today in Guild Wars 2. Uh, they, they were just humans, though, that believed in Abaddon's message of keeping magic, that they liked the magic. Yes, the magic was causing chaos, but the Marganites perhaps had done really well with the magic or Abaddon had given them a really good reason for why he'd given it out and he believed everybody had it. Whatever their reason was, they believed so much in Abaddon and his message that these humans, the Marganites, they waged war against five gods for him. That's how much they believed in Abaddon. And that's what Marganites are. They're humans that fought against gods on Tyria. So in the Fractal, again, to tie it back to the Fractal, what we should be seeing here is the armies of the Marganites, uh, pirates basically, as they were, a seafaring culture lining the ocean's horizon around like a tropical island uh, fighting alongside their god Abaddon against five other gods. Uh, there, there's no records of any other allies of Abaddon basically it was just him and the Marganites but I suppose there could have been some other there's just like no specific lore about it but that's what we should be seeing in the fractal fleets of ships at war. Now something very obscure and interesting as well that I found uh, about the island we could potentially see in this fractal um, is that there are there are various landmarks you could find in Guild Wars 1. When you explore the Realm of Torment, you could find all of these things that had been dragged down from the real world, from Tyria, into Torment, where the gods had been trying to hide Abaddon's existence, right? One of them is the Temple of the Six, which is where you read that inscription about Jadoth that I read just now, uh, and where the climax of the Guild Wars 1 story happens, essentially. Um, but there are there are some other interesting areas as well. One of them's called the Atrocity Library, which is a really cool name for a place, uh, which is basically this huge stronghold that was built by the Marganites before the fall of Abaddon. Uh, so this existed on Tyria at one point. Um, and the Atrocity Library now contains the names of every single victim that was ever murdered murdered in Abaddon's name, including how they were slain. So it's quite a grim, quite a dark idea now. Uh, but the law says that at the heart of the Atrocity Library is a place called the Malafarium. And the Malafarium is described as the heart of Marganite culture before the fall. Okay, so if we believe that, then it might make sense that when Abaddon died, when he was cast down, maybe where he had his last stand was there at the Malafarium at the heart of Marganite culture. And maybe that's where the ruins of Mora would eventually be built after the gods strike Abaddon down, they strike his city down, they strike his people down, and then it's a clean slate and the humans come along, find this tear in the fabric of reality and build the city of Mora. So, what I'm saying is in this fractal, what we could be seeing is a large ocean set with an island on it with a very distinct looking structure that we saw in the first game that's now obviously upgraded and looks new and, you know, they have their own creative liberties they can take with it. But what we're seeing is the Atrocity Library and the Malafarium. That could be an interesting place and that's where we go in to fight Abaddon. What I'm saying is that they've got this lore, they've got a lot of little things you can pick at to decide how they could make this. Um, another thing, another really big thing, okay, so we've got Abaddon and the Marganite. But who are they fighting? Okay, well, first of all, the, the five remaining gods, right? We've got Lyssa, Melandru, Balthazar, Duena, their leader. Okay, these are these are four gods we know that were there. And Grenth? Well, Grenth's kind of an interesting one to choose there, because Grenth, like Cormir, 
has only recently become a god. Uh, we don't actually know when Grenth took over from his previous god, which was another god of death named Doom. Uh, we don't know whether that happened during all this time with all these fights. Was it Doom that was participating in all this stuff with the Bloodstone, or was it Grenth? That's something, that's a big mystery, that's a big thing that ArenaNet have never given us the specific answer on that they would have to in this fractal. They would have to show us, who is it? Is it, is it Grenth or is it Doom? And we'd have more of an idea of the timeline. And it would be a really interesting curveball, I think, if they made it Doom. I mean, Christ, that would be a showcase of a very weird, obscure god that we haven't seen for a while. Um, a another really interesting note as well, and I, I hate, I'm literally pulling my hair out about this. I hate that I don't have a source. But I specifically re remember that in the first game, there is a reference to the fact that Abaddon had actually already defeated one of the gods he was fighting against before he had his last stand. Like, that he managed to take down one of these gods. At least one of these gods was defeated in their conflict. And the way it's worded, it's just as vague as that. So that could mean that this was a totally different god that we've never even really heard about but was defeated and taken down. It could mean that he temporarily defeated a god that was then somehow revived or brought back in the picture after he was cast down by the others. Or it could mean any number of other things. I do specifically remember when I, I got to this little bit of lore when I was doing my coverage of it before that uh, we theorised that god that he defeated could have been Lissa because Lissa is the patron of an area of the world known as Vabi which is very close to where this fractal will be taking place and since she had so much dominion over Vabi maybe it's her that had fallen and that's how the fight ended up taking place there. Um, I, I remember saying that and that, that's very key as well if he defeated one of the gods that's going to mean a lot for what we see in this fractal and ArenaNet are going to have to go back and consult this law. But, to, to speed this along a bit, back to the original question, who would they fight? Well, we've got the five remaining gods, but is that it? Is it five gods versus Abaddon and an army of Marganites? That would be kind of interesting, but surely not. Well, you know, that you could very well have King Doric and all of his men fighting at the gods' side. This is at a time where all human nations are united under one banner, under King Doric. And it was King Doric himself who had asked the gods to shatter the bloodstone and take magic back. So, this is... this could be a big moment for King Doric to have his army. What if it's the five true gods and King Doric and his men versus Abaddon and his Marganites? If you go that way, then you really can have very large armies and interesting set piece, again, where we have these massive nautical battles going on between King Doric's men and the Marganites, who presumably would be superior at warfare on water, being a culture that lives on the seas. You know, another potential one as well that I don't really see fitting too well, uh, but the Forgotten. The Forgotten could be an element here because, again, this is in sort of their region of the world. This is this massive fight going on, but it's not even including the people that sort of live there with the Marganites right now. The Forgotten, you know, this is their territory. Uh, but I find it hard to see the Forgotten teaming up with either one particular side, and I feel like if it was a three-way thing, you know, the Forgotten just sort of poke their head in here, it would be a bit misplaced, or they couldn't really do any justice to it. So I doubt we'll see Forgotten. Uh, we haven't even seen arena d design any real forgotten four guild wars 2 they've just been mentioned mostly in a and that's about it so i doubt we'll see those but you know it's a possibility and particularly when you think about the story not just the fractal yes it, it wouldn't be too hard to assume that they could be forgotten going on there uh, they could be an interesting tertiary enemy you don't know Here's another big topic as well, one of the last ones I want to get on about this fractal. We already kind of have a pretty good idea of what this could end up like. What would Abaddon look like? That's a that's a pretty big question. Uh, a bit like with the Marganites, your regular Guild Wars 1 veteran probably has the complete wrong idea about what Abaddon would look like. Um, because a Guild Wars 1 player would think of an insanely huge, uh, monstrous beast with eight eyes and bound arms filled with magic. Uh, but in truth, Abaddon really only took that form that we saw in Guild Wars 1 after a thousand years of torture and suffering in the realm of torment. Um, in, the, in his life, if you, if you wish, in his godliness, he was pretty much like the other gods. He, he was small, he was regular sized, I guess, and, and humanoid. Uh, you can find really sort of rare and hard to spot images of him in the Guild Wars Nightfall campaign, sort of dotted about, and you can find these murals of Abaddon that portray him in his old human form. Um, and that's what he should look like in the fractal, not some massive overdone boss that's a mimicry of what we saw at the end of Guild Wars 1. Not that at all. He should be what ArenaNet were hinting him to look like during the plot. The, the sort of subtle hints that they were showing us in Nightfall, that he was just this regular humanoid god back then, that's what he should look like in this fractal. Um, unless, perhaps, just before he falls, he makes some big transformation into what we eventually saw in Guild Wars 1. 
Uh, but I would be really disappointed. I've got to say, I'd be very disappointed to see ArenaNet do a big mammoth monster and just forget all these sort of intriguing aspects and uh, Easter eggs, basically, that they laid about him in the first game. A big touch of the first game was you could actually see in a mission uh, Abaddon's very armor. You could see his weapons and the armor that he wore as he died. You could see that stuff was shaped for sort of a regular-sized humanoid character. So ArenaNet shouldn't make him this massive big monster because that would just completely invalidate all the, these items and the armor and stuff we saw in Guild Wars 1. And it would even possibly invalidate that this mural that we saw, this painting of him as a regular god. I think that would be much more compelling to see him in his true form that has already been hinted at. Like, they can't forget that they that they wrote that. They have to, you know, honor that. If they're going to do this fractal, that's what I want to see Abaddon look like. Not a massive boss like the Colossus. Um, for that matter, though, what do the other gods look like too? That's my opinion kind of on Abaddon. But my opinion on the other gods is kind of maybe a bit more harsh. And this is where my view might start changing from a lot of you guys watching, okay? A lot of people have been very excitedly mentioning that there are five gods, okay? Five gods versus Abaddon. And we play fractals with five players. So just like in the Char fractal, how we all become Char, we can play as the five true gods. How amazing will that be? And, okay, I get you, that, that sounds kind of exciting, but I, I've got kind of a lot of problems with this. Um, first of all, we don't actually know what the human gods look like. And that's always been a massive, massive theme about this part of the law. okay? Uh, there, there's even specific law that they released in Guild Wars 2 that states anyone who has ever even looked at a true god, any human, any mortal that looks at a god, is instantly blinded. And for that reason, no humans know what he looked like. Only one human ever got to see the true gods in their true form. Uh, and that was a guy called Malkor, and that, that's a whole different story though. Uh, only one person ever did, everyone else has had to guess at what the true gods look like based on statues that Malkor built for them, and, and interpretations that changed over the ages. Uh, the humans of Cantha, the humans of Elona, and the humans of Tyria all have their own different interpretations of what the gods look like. That's always been a really fascinating and realistic and cool part of the story of Guild Wars for me, that if you go to these different continents, because no humans know specifically what they look like, they all have these different statues and quirks and ideas about what these gods represent. Uh, the, but the point here is is that there's always been a big element of mystery and intrigue about the gods. And I sort of don't want that to go away. I know I talk a lot about, oh, they, they should return to the old storylines. And I still stand by that. But when it comes to the, the the gods, I don't want a specific defined look to the human gods when a lot of what currently defines them is their lack of a, a true vision. I, I don't want to be able to say for definite, I don't want to be able to say that the Alonans were more wrong about their depiction of Lyssa than the Tyrians and Canthers. And I know that for a fact. And the Alonans were wrong because they drew Lyssa with two faces and she only has one face. You know, I prefer her as this sort of infinitely paradoxical entity that is both two things and one thing at once that the devs have always written so eloquently and wonderfully that just tricks your imagination in just the right way. I want to keep that. I don't want to have a defined look for what this is like and I equally don't want that for the other gods either. I like the idea of the symbolism and the poetry behind those characters. That's what gives the lore, the gods themselves, their meat for me. And for that reason, I, I don't really want to see them at all, you know, let alone play as them. Uh, you know, playing as them is like a whole other level. It might be cool to play as a god, yeah, but only for a while, right? I mean, doesn't putting the players so intimately in control of the gods take a lot away from how powerful we're meant to perceive them to be. You know, it certainly won't be very fun to get my ass kicked while I'm playing as a god. And fractals are pretty much the worst way they could add this. Fractals are designed to be run over and over and over and over again. Yes, it will be cool the first time, but eventually it will just fall into monotony. And fractals are designed to get harder and harder and harder. So eventually, I am just going to keep getting my ass kicked at, while playing as a god. You know, you look at the Jade Fractal, it's cool, it was set in an interesting environment, but I don't give a damn about the Jade Fractal anymore because it's in a game type where I'm constantly replaying it over and over. It's not special anymore. I'd hate for something this cool about the gods. You know, eventually we might see the gods, but if it's a glimpse would be way better, not something that's going to be permanently in the game repeated over and over and over. This is coming from me in a climate with this game where everyone wants permanent content. I'm actually saying, no, don't make something like this permanent in such a way that we'll be repeating it constantly. I think that would be really bad. I do not want 
want it to fall into that same trap as the Jade Fractal, where it just drops to monotony, or, or worse, something that I end up loathing to see. It would be horrible if this new God Fractal was particularly long or difficult, and in the end I loathe seeing it because it's too long and I want to get my run done quicker, so instead I'm re-rolling, and I have this knee-jerk negative reaction to seeing one of the coolest moments in the lore for this game. I don't want that. Now, I, uh, don't get me wrong, going back to what I just said, I, I do want to see the story come forward, and I do want ArenaNet to return to the old stories and stuff, and I think this is, like, one of the best things that they could return to, but I don't want that return to be in a 15-minute bite-sized dungeon encounter. You know, I want this big stuff to have real significance and be made big. I want it to be a part of a large feature-rich story arc, you know, that's in line with what we'd get from a traditional expansion. Even even if it has to be packaged in the living story strategy, I don't think a fractal is the best way, the best way that they could do this. If they are going to give us everything on a plate, give us all the gods, give us all of these crazy answers and things just, but it's produced by one small team and it's only going to be about 50 minutes of gameplay and it's a part of a fractal, for all those reasons above, I don't think that sits well with me at all. Um, however, that said, you know, I do still think there's a lot of room for this general idea. The, uh, the fall of Abaddon could be a very interesting fractal without stepping on the toes of giving us all of the gods and just ruining all of this stuff up front and blowing the secret of the five, basically. You know, I've, I've spent most of this video hopefully demonstrating to you guys that there's a lot of very cool ideas that they can go with without even looking at the gods themselves. You could set up a really awesome, like, nautical battle that sort of takes place on or around a tropical island you know, a real battle, like, with moving ships, like the airship that you see in Ara, but, you know, loads of these pieces moving around, uh, and it's got solid gameplay and encounters that are based around these moving vehicles and things. I think that would be really, really cool. You know, you could have Doric's men, you you are participating as a soldier in Doric's army, maybe you're an original Orion, you know, we're fighting all these Risen right now, maybe you're playing as one of these Risen while they were alive, and they were fighting the good fight. You know, you're fighting as one of the Orions with Doric's men, and you're against Abaddon and his Marganites, and, you know, you are boarded by enemies as their ships come by, or you board enemy vessels, you know, you sink ships, uh, and, and then maybe you do, you go after Abaddon himself. Um, perhaps you see him in his sort of human form, or maybe even it's in his corrupted form like we saw in Guild Wars 1. Uh, Abaddon, I think, is a lot more on the table because he's a lot less relevant now. His story is pretty much done. So, you know, they can go nuts with Abaddon, do a lot of really good stuff, and I would love to see Abaddon in his original armour as we saw in Guild Wars 1, and something that resembles the mural we saw again that was hinted at in Guild Wars 1. Um, you know, we, we can go up against Abaddon himself, it's just the, the, the five gods I feel like should be more in the background, you know, magical explosions and effects that show they have some presence in the battle without sort of completely spoiling it, as long as it didn't seem too contrived, you know. Maybe you're not specifically in the main, in the vanguard of the army, maybe you're just a group of pirates or, or forgotten maybe even, who, who run aground as all of the, the oceans dry up and you, you've got to learn to navigate without your regular equipment. You know, Guild Wars 1, the Crystal Desert was a really cool area because it was full of Marganite wrecks, these really intricate, cool looking shipwrecks, uh, thousands of miles inland. And the reason they were there is because they went down with the sea level when Abaddon died, and, and they were just sort of left to rot in the sand evermore. And they always looked really striking and really cool, and I'd love to be able to see that happen for my own eyes, see these ships run aground right in front of me in the fractal. I think that would be really cool. And you know, that doesn't have to have anything to do with the actual fight between the gods, which is what, you know, admittedly, I think most people are desperate to see. Anyway, um, I, I think I've talked for long enough. Basically, I just want to say that it's a concept that worries me because I am, I feel, quite cynical about how much lore ArenaNet know they've put into the game, right? Uh, do they remember the, the, the piece about Abaddon having already defeated one god uh, before this final confrontation? Do they actually remember that? Do they know under what context they talked about that? Do they have more insider information about when they mentioned that? Or was it just sort of a small thing they threw in and now they're going to ignore? You know, do they rem even remember that this is supposed to be like an ocean we're fighting on or that, or that it would be a ni nice to to at least see some of the sea. Uh, I guess that last one's probably true, that they probably know it's got something to do with the ocean, because after all, why would the pirate, Evan Nashblade, uh, be so motivated to make this fractal for us. I think that lines up quite nicely. We vote for the pirate guy, and he gives us a fractal based on the high seas and, and nautical fights and stuff. Um, and that pretty much, that brings me nicely back around to sort of the <laughs> quite humble beginnings of this video. Um, 
Next week, we get to vote on someone. Ellen Keel or Evan Nashblade, okay? Ellen Keel is probably uh, your typical Guild Wars 2 player's favourite right now, you know, and, and the farmer's favourite. Um, these people that don't really care about the story because Guild Wars 2 didn't capture people with its story. It's got a good one, but didn't capture people with it. Um, you know, I think that's the majority of our play player base. Most people won't care. They'll read The Fall of Abaddon and be like, eh, you know, whatever. It's old lore. It's lore I'm not really interested in, whatever. And on the other hand, they'll see lower waypoint reduction and they'll just go for that instantly. I do think Ellen Keel has got a really strong lead here, um, but I do want to show you guys what you get if you vote for Evan Nashblade. This is a very cool concept for Fractal, despite my worries and stuff. As you can tell, I'm quite torn on it. I really don't know whether I want to see it or not, because it could be so amazing, but then it could also sort of be ruined. So I don't know. But one vote, Ellen Keel, is, is a vote for the regular gamer, I think, and the people that want the waypoints. And the other vote is for the law, but also a vote for RNG at the same time. So it's going to be tough if we end up seeing this one. I would love to see it, and I would probably hate to see it at the same time. But those are my thoughts on it. Uh, I do want to talk about Ellen's Fractal as well, the idea of the Thormanova Reactor. But I've gone on long enough. Maybe that'll be another video. Uh, I think the Thormanova Reactor's got a lot more lore to it than people actually know about. But it's all, even when you add all of the lore it's got up, it's still not particularly exciting. The most interesting thing about the Thormanova Reactor is that it's got a lot of lore written about it, which means ArenaNet have got some plan for it rather than the law that be that is there is any good if that makes sense but in the end though guys i'm not going to tell you what to think about this or where to go with your votes i'm not going to put out a video and be like oh you must vote for nash blade i think a lot of people will be expecting me to say i'll go for nash blade but i've got i've got my excitement about it definitely and i've got my doubts at the same time so i've just given you the information it's there for you to do with what you will uh, thank you very much for watching, guys. Uh, I know it's been a long one. Uh, I'm very happy to anybody who actually made it the whole way through. I know how these can drop off after they're quite long. But thank you very much, honestly, guys. And uh, let me know what you think. I will see you next time.